Mushroom Wonderland. Hey, how's it going? It's Aaron Hilliard for Mushroom Wonderland. If you don't know me, I'm the creator of Mushroom Wonderland here on YouTube and on Instagram. I'm also the vice president of the Kitsap Peninsula Mycological Society. I live here in the Pacific Northwest in Washington State. Uh, right down in the Puget Sound. Part of the reason that there's so many types of mushrooms that grow here in the Pacific Northwest is because there are a lot of ectomycorrhizal mushrooms that grow in association with these big beautiful conifers that we have here. So conifers are the trees that are evergreen. They stay green all year round and we have a lot of different varieties of them here in the Northwest. Uh, Washington is known as the evergreen state because we have so many of these evergreens. Here in Washington State, a lot of the mushrooms that associate with the evergreen associate with oak trees and other deciduous trees in other parts of the world but here in the Pacific Northwest a lot of these big beautiful conifer trees are host to a variety of delicious wild edible mushrooms so in this series of videos we're going to be talking a bit about tree identification so that you can identify a tree in a certain forest and then know that mushrooms certain mushrooms are going to be growing with those trees the importance of this is because a lot of mushrooms depend on trees to grow. Mycorrhizal mushrooms have an association with trees and they grow and they attach to the roots and they have this symbiotic relationship with trees. These type of mushrooms you cannot find without their host tree. So today we're going to be talking about the Douglas fir or the Pseudotsuga mensisi. This is uh, the Oregon state tree. The Douglas fir is not a fir tree at all. And it's not even in the genus Abies with real fir trees like Grand and Noble Fir. It is actually in a genus of its own called Pseudosuga, which literally translates into false hemlock. Besides other things, the main thing that differentiates it from a true fir tree is that its cones hang from the branch and they fall from the tree intact, much like a hemlock. Where a true fir trees grow their cones standing upright only on the uppermost branches and they fall apart while they're still attached to the tree. You will never find a true fir cone laying on the ground unless the tree or cone has been injured or damaged. The Douglas fir was named after its discoverer Archibald Menzies and a botanist named David Douglas. The trees are unique to the Pacific Northwest and have really only been a staple in the forests around here for the past 10 to 12,000 years, a relatively short time on the evolutionary time scale. They dominate the uppermost canopy of the forests west of the Cascade Mountain Range to the coast from California all the way up through British Columbia. These trees reach seed bearing age at about 20 years old. Their seeds cannot germinate on mossy or leaf covered soil and they need mineral soil to sprout new seedlings. In this respect, they depend on forest fires to strip and clear away shade producing undergrowth and prepare the soil for new seedlings. The trees can grow over 300 feet tall and live for around 600 years before they topple over. They love full sunlight and lots of water. The trees are self pruning, meaning they lose their lower branches naturally. This also is an added defense against forest fires. These trees are incredibly valuable to thousands of species of fungus and plants that grow mycorrhizal connections with them, as well as the lichens, mosses, and wildlife that depend on them. They even have an ability to communicate and share with the other trees around them through a fungal network beneath the soil. We as humans not only use these trees for building materials and firewood, but the resin has been used for thousands of years by the native peoples medicinally and as chewing gum, and the young tender shoots can be made into a nutritious tea containing lots of vitamin C. This tree, along with the western hemlock, is responsible for the majority of ectomycorrhizal mushrooms that grow here in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. The mycelium from these mushrooms will search the forest floor until it meets a compatible host and only then can it produce a fruiting body. Understanding the significance of these trees is key to helping conservation efforts and to understand where to start looking for certain types of wild mushrooms that you want to forage. The way I see it, if you want to find a lot of mushrooms to eat, head to a forest with a lot of mature Douglas fir and that's where you'll find them. Some of the mushrooms that are dependent on these trees are the Pacific Golden Chanterelle, the Lobster Mushroom, 
the Matsutake, the Porcini, the Morel, the Hedgehog Mushroom, the Winter Chanterelle, the Amanitas, the Lacarias, the Lactarius, the Russula, the Hydnellums. This is just the beginning of the list. It is thought that over a thousand mushrooms need connections with trees like these to produce even one mushroom. Some of the ways that you can identify the Douglas fir tree is it's got these small needles on it. Underneath the needles, if you look really close, it's got two little tiny white stripes. Um, and they have needles all the way around the stem, so it's kind of like a bottle brush, and they're really, really soft. Uh, they have these little tiny brown buds at the ends of the tips. This is going to become new growth. It's got a real kind of citrusy smell. And so this is not a true fir tree like a grand fir or a noble fir. Douglas fir is actually its own genus of tree. It's called the pseudo tuga because the tuga tree is the hemlock. And this is not actually a hemlock and it's not actually a fir, so it's in its own category. Um, it's more like a hemlock in that its cones hang down off of the branches, whereas true fir trees, the cones actually grow up on the branches. But if you've ever seen a hemlock cone, it's just a tiny little thing, and a Douglas fir cone is actually quite a bit bigger. So this is what a Douglas fir cone looks like. And it's got all these um, little tiny whips growing out of it. You see these little tiny points. They're like these little three pointed bracts that grow in between the scales on the cone. And so there's a little story about how these got there. And an old Indian tale is that uh, there was a great forest fire long, long ago and all the wildlife was running from the fire and all the bigger animals could get out of the way of the fire, but the little mice couldn't quite outrun the fire. So they tried to run up a maple tree and the maple tree said, don't run up us. We have big leaves and we fan the flames. We're gonna get burned. So the mice ran off through the forest and then they tried to climb a Western red cedar. But the cedar tree said, no, my bark is way too thin. I'm gonna catch on fire too. You gotta keep running, keep looking for somewhere else. And so the mice finally found that they could run up the deep furrows in the bark of the Douglas fir tree. And they ran up and they hid in the pine cones and that's how they escaped being burned by the fire. And to this day, you can see the little tails of the mice hanging out of the cones where they're hiding in there from the fire. So kind of a cool little story. So the Douglas fir is an amazing tree. These Douglas firs are some of the biggest trees in the world. They rival the sequoias and the redwoods and they can grow five, six, seven hundred years and grow about, uh, you know, over 300 feet tall. Take a look at this massive tree, maybe my favorite tree. Look at the size of this fir tree. They say it's the biggest tree in Kitsap County. Look at how big that bad boy is though. Next to it, give you an idea just how big these native firs could get in the Northwest, but they have been slaughtered and butchered and logged. So I think it imperative that we try to do what we can on an individual and a group level, try to preserve these big, huge trees like this. It is a glorious grandmother tree. Can't even imagine how many of these smaller fir trees are descendants or direct children from this huge fir tree. So. This is a big family out here. These trees, they all talk to each other and they help each other out. Once I started to realize that, I saw the forest in a whole different way and I started to really have a lot of love and respect for these trees. These big, huge grandma and mother trees. And then even these younger ones that are really close. This one's really healthy also, very tall. And I would bet that it's a direct descendant from this huge fir over here. So it's kind of neat. They're all living in their own little ecosystem here you can really see how deep the furrows are in this bark on a douglas fir the bark is so thick like this and it really helps to protect it from forest fire because the fire can't really get into the cambium layer so you can see these trees that are still very much alive that have charcoal on them sometimes from a forest fire that happened a hundred years ago they're really good at resisting the fire so while everything else in the under canopy burns and when a forest fire comes through, 
That's actually how the forest floor gets prepared for young Douglas fir to sprout and new seedlings to grow and start the cycle all over again. So if you're looking for an old growth forest here in the Pacific Northwest, there's four criteria to an old growth forest and that's gonna be large standing live trees. There's gonna be large standing dead trees. There's gonna be huge logs laying on the ground and there's also going to be a multi-layered canopy so you're going to have western red cedar you're going to have um, western hemlock and then at the very top you're going to have the dominant canopy of the douglas fir trees um, and all this rotten wood on the ground makes for what we call a old growth forest and those are typically 100 years old or older some forests just never really get to having all four of those characteristics These big trees also have a lot of uh, medicinal and edible uses. Uh, they can be used for humans and animals alike, and they have so many different things growing on them. They're like an ecosystem in themselves, and they can support other life, including human life. So very, very useful trees. So these are amazingly beautiful trees, uh, much to be respected, and uh, they really make the landscape of the Pacific Northwest, the way that they grow, the way that they die, the way that they decompose, and the way that they regrow. It's a beautiful cycle that we just happen to be around in the middle of, is these beautiful Doug firs growing in the Northwest. So I hope you got some value out of that video. If you're new to this channel, hit subscribe. We're gonna be talking all about mushrooms all year long. And once in a while, I throw in a wild card like this tree identification videos. So, uh, hey, thanks for joining Mushroom Wonderland and we hope to see you on the next one. Take care, people.